had a, a family, nobody to wake up in the morning or, or guide me or teach me nothing. So I was raised in orphanages from California to North Carolina, Missouri, and back to California before I was nine years old. Um, I did get into my first foster home, and um, I keep this soft. I don't know how to say it. Um, from nine to ten years old, the people that were keeping me were hurt me pretty bad. They, you know, they, um, I was molested for like a year and a half. And so at an early age, I started doing drugs. And I got into a lifestyle because I found out when I started getting high, all that pain that I was going through inside here, um, I couldn't I couldn't tell nobody what had happened. I couldn't tell nobody that I felt unworthy, that nobody loved me and nobody wanted me because I didn't have a family, so I hid it. And I, what I did is I kind of blocked it up, put it in a room inside, and I shut the door. And But what happens when you do stuff like that, when you shut that stuff off and you don't go to somebody that cares about you and tell them and talk to them about it, 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 it starts to fester and it starts to blow up. And I started getting doing drugs at like 11 years old. And I found out what happened was that pain that I was building up inside that I put behind them closed doors, um, I didn't think of it no more. Because I was getting high, it didn't let me think. When you're doing drugs and you're drinking, um, you don't think about your problems no more. But what happens is the problems are still there and that how it started festering, it finally blew up. Between that time, um, um, I was still back and forth in the foster homes. I was back and forth in juvenile hall. I was still going. They were telling me that there was something wrong with me, so nobody wanted to have anything to do with me. So at 17 years old, I joined the service. I figured if I go into service, you know, maybe this would, might straighten me out. And I joined the Marine Corps at 17. And um, that helped me out for a little while because they don't allow you to do drugs. But what happened was I started drinking alcohol real bad because you could do, I was 17 in the Marine Corps, I could go anywhere I wanted to to drink. So I, I was drinking alcohol real heavy. And I did six years, I did real well in the Marine Corps, I became an MP. I wanted to come out to the Marine Corps and be a, a motorcycle cop. I wanted to go to California and be like, I don't know if any of you guys remember Chips. That's what I always wanted to be when I got out of service. But what happened when I got out because of me not taking care of all their problems and all the issues that I had for me growing up, they came back. And it was kind of like a demon in a way, came back and started getting inside my head and telling me that I, was, I wasn't worthy and that I was just a piece of junk that nobody wanted. And so I went right back into the lifestyle, but this time, I was a lot more dangerous because I was older, I was a lot bigger, I was trained in the Marine Corps to fight and to kill, so to speak, and so I got into a heavy duty lifestyle that took me down some real, real dark, dirty path. Um, I got did. I, I met my first wife and I started having kids and I remember when my first daughter was born, I looked at her and I said, you know, I'm going to be the best father you've ever seen. You know, I, I'm not going to let nothing get in, my, in the way of you. I will always be here to protect you. And I meant it at the time, but this is how the drugs, when you start doing them, what happens is it, you don't think. You know, there, nothing else matters to you in the world but, but, but them drugs. And um, at the time I said that to my baby girl, um, I meant it, but something happened. I, again, I wasn't dealing with the pain and the issues, and I took off again. And I had my second daughter said the same thing to her when she was born. Right after her, I took off and left the state and, and moved somewhere else to hide. I was getting in trouble with the law. Um, I was facing a lot of time in jail if they caught me. They finally caught up to me, and I went to prison for three years. I did my time in prison. I got out, and I kept running. You know, I had my third and my fourth daughter, and never I never even watched them get born because my lifestyle didn't include a family. My lifestyle I lived didn't include for me to be able to be around people that loved me or that I could love. So I didn't, I didn't even really know what the love was. I just stayed deep and deep. What I used to think is people call me a dirtbag and a scumbag, and that's what I lived at. And it was real easy for me to live that because I didn't have to prove nothing to nobody. I, was, I felt that that's what I already was. You know, um, I never had a chance to go talk to nobody about this stuff. Back then in them days, a man, you don't talk about your emotions or your feelings, and you sure don't tell them things, bad things that had happened to you, you just kind of block them off and you muscle up and you go with it. Don't let nobody get, get inside your head and, and tell you no different. And so I was a very miserable, nasty, mean person. Um, when the drugs, the drugs didn't do no good for you. Didn't, you know, when I was saying the drugs were hiding the pain, when that stopped, I was doing any kind of drug and putting any kind of drug in my body when I couldn't 
that wouldn't stop the pain no more. I turned to violence, which was a, to me was another drug, which I hurt a lot of people very badly. And today, today, you know, God's working on that because I still have the nightmares from them days. I still have the night my nightmares of the people that I hurt because because of my lifestyle. I don't like to talk a lot about that stuff, but that is part of the story, and that's what God's using in my life today to put me to be the man that I am today and because of my past. So see, God to take all this negative, bad things that most people look down at you on if you're still doing that, and he'll turn it around and make, turn it into a positive. So I'm able to get out there and I'm able to, um, to, to touch people's lives that starting off in the same lifestyle that I lived. You know, a lot of them things, in a way, I kind of helped invent it because I was doing these things before they were actually, you know, before they were actually something normal that people did on the street. And um, because of me being that way, I'm able to do what I do today. But I want to jump ahead and tell you about what's really cool nowadays is God because I was in, I, I, I was married to my wife that I'm with right now and um, she had me committed into a hospital because I tried to commit suicide. The pain got so good. So, so hard that um, I, I tried to hang myself because I, it was, I was hurting so bad. Again, I was 42 years old and I, ha I, I couldn't go to nobody and tell them I needed help. I couldn't go to nobody and say, you know what, I'm hurting and I don't know why. You know, this happened to me and if I, I, I want to stop doing drugs, but I can't. It's just something pulling at me. So I went to a hospital and they, they committed me. To, the police department came and got me, took me to this hospital told me they were going to get me off the drugs and kind of laughed at it because I didn't know how to live without it. When I woke up in the morning, that's the first thing I did. You know, I got high. So I got out. I wasn't allowed to go back to my house. Um, I had a restraining order that could, wouldn't allow me back in my house. And so I lived with somebody else. I started going to meetings. They told me to go to NA meetings and do this and do this. And I tried it for a little while. And I know God was working in my life because for some reason, I didn't go back and get high. I, I didn't. I, I tried. I wanted to. I'd sit at night and isolate. I wouldn't talk to nobody. But for some reason, I wasn't getting high anymore. So I went on about two years of doing that, really struggling, trying to figure out how to do this. And I knew I needed something spiritual because my lifestyle was starting to come back. I was starting to go back into that violent lifestyle. I wanted to go back and do some of the things I used to do. I could feel myself the drug and alcohol and that kind of um, setting was pulling me back. So I figured, you know, I, how do I get spirituality? Let me try to start going to church. So back then I had real long, my hair was down on my waist. So I cut it all off. I got clean shaven. I got me some button up shirts that I, I thought you had to wear if you went to church. And I went to start going to church. And I was clean cut. I looked pretty, believe it or not. <laughs> and, uh, but I was going for the wrong reason. I was going to please all the people in the congregation. I wanted to look like they looked like. And I just wanted them to accept me. That's all I cared about. I didn't care what people thought of me. I just wanted to be accepted somewhere. So I went to every church in Mercer County trying to find a church that I fit in with. And I, I just couldn't find it. So I remember one day I was riding my motorcycle and I thought, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm a scumbag. I might as well head back and do what I used to do. And I remember I went to this guy's house that I used to get my drugs from and I kicked his door in. And I got two bags of dope, and then I went and sat in the bar, and I had a shot and a beer sitting in front of me. And I had everything I needed on the bar. I mean, I even threw the drugs on the bar, and I figured this was the day I was going to go back out and get started again. And I called somebody, and they came after me. Um, they just sat there and talked to me. They talked me into not doing it that day. The following Sunday, I was driving, riding my bike, and I seen this big truck and a trailer, and it said, Soldier of Christ Motorcycle Ministry, and I started laughing, and I'm going, Motorcycles and Christians, they don't mix. There's no way possible. It's just like, you know, throwing oil and water. They just don't mix together. So I pulled in anyway, and I talked to him. His name was Pastor Tramp. And um, he comes somewhat of the yeah, that was his name. He, <laughs> and um, he comes from this kind of same type of lifestyle, a little different. But he invited me to come to church, and I said, yeah, you know, I'll go. And he said, well, follow me. And I said, you know what, well, I'll meet you there. And it took me six months to get there, but I, I finally went to this church. And then the following, I, I went to the church, and when I walked in, the people, they just, for some reason, I got such a warm feeling, everybody accepted me. Just, I went in in a t-shirt, and I and I think I might even had a, a t-shirt on, just a Harley Davidson t-shirt, and that was it. And they accepted me. The following Thursday, I went to buy my first Bible study, 
and the guys were in there, we were talking, and they, you know, we were praying, and then one of them looked at me and said, do you want to, you know, do you want to get to know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? I said, sure. I said, I tried everything up till now. I might as well try this. And I sincerely gave my heart over to Jesus that night. And what was so cool is that emptiness that I felt all my life that I was trying to fill with the drugs and with the alcohol and with the women and with the violence and all that stuff, it instantly got filled and it was such an awesome, warm feeling. Um, and I remember going home and telling my wife, I was all excited, I said, "Huh? guess what I did tonight? And she thought I got high and I said, well, I kind of am, but, you know, but what happened was I, I gave my life over to God. And she goes, what? And she goes, what did you do, join a cult? And I said, no, it was, it's cool, it's a biker church. And, she didn't want nothing to do with it, but I was so excited because at one time I felt like I was somebody that I was worth something, and I went to bed that night, I woke up the next morning, that emptiness was back, and I felt that, that emptiness in the pit of my gut again, and, and I'm thinking, oh man, what happened? And I remember the first time I dropped down on my hands and knees, and, and, me, and my, me and God, we got my own personal relationship, I call him dude, I call him friend. But I said, dude, I said, what, whatever you did to me last night, if that was you, I want it back. I said, I can't live this way no more. And so what I did is I prayed and I said, you know, give this back to me and I'll do anything you want me to do and go anywhere you tell me to go. And he filled it that quick again. And from that day on, I, I turned away from everything. I turned away from that lifestyle. You know, I, I wanted to stay as far away from that lifestyle as I could. But I found that once I started reading my Bible, and see, I couldn't read when I got clean either. When I got clean and sober, I, I couldn't read. So they're giving me a Bible and telling me to read this book and everything's going to be okay. And I open it up and I'm looking at these words and it, it, it looked just blurred vision to me, you know, because I could not, I couldn't read a Dr. Seuss book, so to speak. So I did what anybody would do. I just tried. And what I did, I started reading spiritual books and then I went back to the Bible. And I started reading the Bible over and over again, and I kept reading and studying it. And I'd go to Bible studies, I'd start listening to people, and I found out that, you know what, God don't make no junk. And my favorite scripture in the Bible is 2 Corinthians 5.17. And it assures us and it tells us that, you know, when we become a new creation through Jesus Christ, that old life is gone, and it's done. Meaning that I gave that up, I, I walk with God now, and that part of my life is always gone. And... So I struggled with that because I didn't want to remember all these things that happened to me. And I remember sitting down studying one night and God told me, he says, this is what we're going to use, you know, for what I want you to do for me. And it's to go out into the streets and it's to go out into different places and, and pull these young people out to where they're hurting and they're starting to get in the same lifestyle that I was living. Don't let you guys get started in that. And it ain't so much the drugs and the alcohol are bad, I'm, I'm telling you straight up. But we, I, I, I had to start finding a way to let people know that it's the issues that turn you to the drugs and the alcohol. It's the stuff that we hold inside. You know, if we, number one, if we, if we can't give it up to God, that He'll take it. He promised us. Go to a parent or to a, a, a one of your people, adults at your church or your pastor or a teacher or a counselor. <coughs> Excuse me. And humble yourself and tell them, said, look, this is what happened. You know, I don't understand this, or somebody's saying this, or doing this. Because what happened, guys, if you keep that bottle up inside of you, it, 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 it's going to destroy you. And, and the human nature, we got to find a way to stop that pain, you know. The drugs and the alcohol, people think, stop it, and it don't. It just numbs it. That's all we're doing. Is we're trying to, it's like going to a dentist and getting a shot of Novocaine. It only numbs it for a little while, but what happens when, when that Novocaine wears off? You know, the drugs are going to wear off. That's why we're getting so many people nowadays that are dying because of this stuff. You know, God is so awesome. And see, you guys, it, it breaks me. I mean, it, it, it tears me up in a good way to be able to sit here and see young kids sitting here in the evening and, and learning about God and getting closer. Because if you don't have God on your side, you know, this is a hard world to live in. I'll be straight up honest with you. There's people like I used to be out there just waiting for for, for young people to come so they can grab, plain and simple, call it what it is, you know. And uh, it's a little hard to talk to the to kids your age because I'm trying to clean it up the best I can, but, and I'm trying to think before I say a few things, but it, honestly, it's, it's a scary thing, and it's not something to mess with. Don't ever say it won't happen to me, because I work, I'm, I, I volunteer for an organization called City of Angels, which 
Um, Alice is part of Bard, part of, and even Linda, she she part of City of Angels. And what we do is we, we, we help people, young people, any people, to get the help and get off drugs and alcohol. And since I've been working with City of Angels, we've lost 18 kids, all under the age of 26 years old, and all died on just a little, just a small amount of, of drugs. 18 people. And the ones that I physically work with, I've heard it out of their mouth, if not one time, if not a, a dozen times, it won't happen to me, Red. It won't happen to me. You know, and then, then we buried them because they thought they could handle it. And each one of them were trying to numb themselves. Each one of them were doing a drug because they had so much pain inside, you know, that, that they didn't know how to handle it no more. They didn't want to handle it no more. And they gave up. You know, so guys just Think about what was said, and the biggest thing is if you've got issues, if you've got something that you need to talk to an adult about, go to them. You guys have to have at least one person in your life that you can trust. And don't be ashamed if it's not your parents. I'm not saying don't go talk to your parents, because most of the time we can't bring stuff like this to our parents I'm, or, or a family member. But you guys are here, so you guys must be going to some church. So you go to somebody at the church, or you go to somebody at school, you've got counselors there, and talk to them about it. And tell them right away, look, I don't want nobody to know about this, but I need to get this off my chest. I need to talk about it. I don't understand it. Over there, we got literature for, got my testimonies. we got stuff for City of Angels events coming up. Um, there's phone numbers on there if you guys need somebody to talk to about it. You know, but, I mean, please don't sit and hold this stuff in because... You're not going to be no different than anybody else, and sooner or later it's going to grab hold of you, and it's going to be hard to get away from. You know, the cool thing about God being in my life now is all four of my daughters that I, I walked out of their life, and the, my oldest daughter was five years old when I left, and she was a senior in high school before I came back. We we are such best of friends now, and I've got three granddaughters, and I got a grandson on the way, my first grandson, and I can be part of their life. See, they're going to see. They're going to see their grandfather as, as, as a good Christian man. They're going to see their grandfather as, as, as somebody following God and not somebody following the flesh or following the streets or, and the drugs. They will never see me drunk or they will never see me high. They will never see me beating up on somebody. They won't see me stealing, lying, or cheating no more. You know, and this ain't me. It's, it's God, 100%, you know. And for you guys to get at such a young age, what are you guys like? How old are you guys? 13, 14? 12, 12, okay. You know, and, and I was I was sitting there at 12 or 13 years old and I was already out there on the streets and doing the stuff that I, I did all my life. You know, I believe I was in juvenile hall at 12 and 13 years old too for a little while. You know, so it's so much better. To, and you know what? The people that's going to make fun of you, this is what's so cool. When I got clean and sober, when I became a Christian, I had my friends that I rode motorcycles with, look at me and tell me you're, you're a quitter. And I used to, I punched them in the mouth. I'm sorry, but that's what I did. I, I was just starting to go to church because you're not going to call me name. And then I thought about it, and I'm going, you're going right back to the same stuff. You're going to church, and you want your friends to see that you're a good person, and you just punched them in the mouth for what he said. It's just a name. So now I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to admit that I'm a quitter. You know, but uh, but I'm a follower of God, and, and, and I'm in I'm in a family type deal now in the kingdom of God that I don't have to worry about nobody no more. I got plenty of brothers and sisters, uncles, aunts, cousins. I got all the people that I need. You know, and so people's gonna make fun of you. Who cares? I guarantee, you know, you you stay focused on God and keep walking with Him. That He puts the right people, and the people that He puts in your life are people that you, you can depend on, or people that's not gonna judge you. If you need to call them and tell, talk to them about some boy or some girl, they're going to sit and talk to you about it. They're also going to call you on your stuff if you're doing something wrong. If I had somebody, you know, coming to me and saying, dude, I think you're, you're messing up a little bit, I might have not went quite as far as I did. You know, but I had these women, and I shouldn't say it that way, but these women that just, all they cared about was, you know, getting their paycheck, and as long as I stayed out of their hair, they... They just pushed me into a room and left me there and came back when it was time to feed me, so to speak. Orphanage back there was different. You know, so the unworthiness is, is, is I understand that completely, but see, God don't make no jump. Each one of you guys are a miracle, you know. And keeping focused on God and keeping, keeping Him in your life 
if, if, if what's going to put, bring you to be that young man and that young woman, you know. And don't lose the years that I lost because my oldest daughter, um, something bad happened to her from somebody. And, and, you know, I wasn't around to protect her like a father's supposed to do. And um, I live with that today, you know. But now she, you know, me and her are like best friends. You never know that, you know, you never know that we, we had a life like we did together. You know, so I tried to clean it up the best I can. It was just, I didn't want to say too heavy, but all in all, letting leave the drugs and alcohol out of it is the thing that drives you to that the most. You know, it, it, it's the issues that you don't deal with. It's if you feel like you something's wrong, and you know, the way to test yourself is when nobody's around, and this, believe me, it sounds stupid and corny, but this works. Nobody's around, you go in the mirror, and you look at your reflection in the mirror, and you see, and you see what you see. And if you got to be honest for it to work, you got to look at yourself in the mirror and ask yourself, "What do I think? I, who do I think I am?" And if you don't think you're a beautiful young girl or a beautiful young boy, then there's something wrong. You need to talk to somebody. You know, because we see there's nothing wrong with you. And when you carry that burden around and you just think you're a piece of junk and nobody wants you or you know, something has happened to you or somebody, you know, was mean or did something to you and you're blaming yourself, it's not your fault. It wasn't my fault I was raising orphanages, I found out. It wasn't my fault that that guy did all that stuff to me for that bit of time. That, none of that was my fault. Was What was my fault is what the stuff that I contributed to my lifestyle. What was my fault is not being able to go to somebody and talk to somebody about it to get it off my chest, so to speak. You know, so please go to somebody. And I'm looking at some of you guys right now, and I see stuff in your eyes. You know, don't don't hold it in, and don't don't be ashamed and embarrassed for going to an adult and saying, "I'm confused. I don't know what's going on," because you don't want to live this lifestyle. And I would give, and and the people that know me from City of Angels and my ministry, I would give my life, physically for sure, if meant that none of you young people in this world had to go through any of that stuff I went through. And I mean that with all my heart. Because it's not it's not something that you want to see or live. You know. So I hope you know, I hope you guys got a little something from it and Yeah. Question. I think we live in a world that's full of distractions and, and I just wonder how you stay focused on God um, in your daily life or um, you know how do you keep your eyes on Christ? I, I, any situation I get into, I, well, reading my Bible, how do I stay focused? Mm -hmm. Read my Bible, studying, going to church. Church is the fellowship time. You need that. That's the time to get fed. Um, giving back. But what helps me, and this is, I keep things real simple and corny, so I, maybe that's why they call me redneck. But <laughs> any of you remember the old days, how they used to get the old mules to farm? They had this stick above their head and down below they would hang a carrot on and when the mule seen the carrot he would constantly go forward well that's what I do is, is I put a picture of Jesus Christ like that and when I'm feeling down and that's the easiest way to say it I keep things simple and that's how I stay focused that picture is right in front of you God is right in front of you and if you look anything in between the block the vision of that you're going to lose it automatically so there's nothing more important and do not let nothing get in your focus of God God comes first in my life and in my family. You know, and then it comes right on down my job, work, city of angels, all this, you know, you guys. So keeping focus is reading your Bible and um, praying and finding out to get a real close relationship with them. You know, think about, think about having a relationship. And how do you get, you know, you got your best friend, your girlfriend, your, you know, one of your you guys, you got your buds that you like to hang with. How do you get to know them if you spend time with them? Well, that's what you do with God. If you you got to spend time with them. Well, how do I spend time with, you know, people say, well, I can't see them. Well, yeah, you can. Look in the mirror. Go outside and look at the sky. You know, you see a flower. The first thing, time that I realized I could see God is I walked out and looked right outside my front porch, and we have our landscape is nothing but rocks and one bush. And right in the middle of that rocks was a flower that bloomed up that, you know, that was my first sight of God, you know. So um, staying focused is just praying and, and spending time with them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, reflecting back, can you now see that where there 
you think you ran across people in your life when you were younger that uh, were trying to bring you to God and you didn't see it or, mm -hmm. or feel it? Yeah, because I was in a foster home. They were um, the old-timey Southern Baptist. And I went to church, and I, I learned about God. But see, when you're in this, I was in this shell to where I figured that I was just a piece of junk that nobody wanted. I didn't think God even wanted somebody like me because I thought, you know, they used to think I was probably something was wrong with me. They wanted just to lock me up. So when you're growing up and um, thinking that, I figured I was just going to church, honestly, because they made me go, and I could I could go with some other kids, and it was a social type network for me when I went to church, honestly. So, but I had a lot of good people in my life to try, but I was so far gone that I didn't trust nobody. So, what's sad is I had chances. It's not like I was this poor soul that just didn't have a chance. Is I didn't want to trust nobody. I just felt like I had to learn how to deal with myself and, and put my back up against the wall and just start swinging mentally, so to speak, because nothing could get me from behind you know, until I stepped away from the wall and now I got God on my back, so I don't have to worry about it. But, um, yeah, a lot of, I, bet I missed out on a lot of that, a lot of good people that could have, could have helped me or tried. Anybody else have any questions for that? Is it okay if we ask them? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. What's up? Do you wear that jacket every day? This? No, I actually just use it when I ride my motorcycle, and it's just a conversation piece. You know, because I found when I first became a Christian, I wanted to tell, and I was excited, I wanted to tell everybody about Jesus. And when I'm on my bike and I pull up next to a car and they see me, they roll their windows up. And I, you know, I'm serious. So what I do is, this is just a conversation piece. It don't mean nothing to me. And the biker lifestyle, the bikers, they worship their colors. Meaning this is what they look at. They, they would kill if somebody even touched these. You know, but these are just, all it is is a piece of material. It's a con People say, what's this Jesus is Lord stuff? Soldier of Christ. You know, we'll pull over. You want to talk to me? Yeah, I ain't got time. So what I do is I carry my testimonies now. And on the back of the testimony, I got a few of my favorite Bible verses. I got my phone, my name, my phone number, and my email. And I've had people contact me. They won't talk to me physically right there on the street, but it gives me a chance to open up and tell them about Jesus, you know. Because when you get something this good, you want to, you want to, I don't want to, I want to give it away. I want other people to, to feel the love that I found. You know, so not every day, nah. And there's sometimes I don't wear it except if I just ride the motorcycle. <coughs> All these, no, no inquisitive questions. Look at you. Mm -hmm. You guys are too quiet, though. Mm -hmm. I'm not usually this quiet for me. Right. <laughs> yeah. Do your tattoos like have any meaning? Yeah, these are just here are just to cover up because I, I had a lot of bad stuff tattooed on my arm that I, I you know I wanted to cover up. I I, got, I think it was stupid to get them done, so I covered these up. And the rest of them, this is my ministry. This just tell to me is what um it's my colors is what's on the back of my vest. So some of them do have meanings. Other ones were just to get it done, you know. Do you think there's anything that you can do that can separate you from the love of God? Like, and are there any people that you've met that you think could take me away? No, that, that just God has given up on. Or did you ever no, feel like God? God don't give up on nobody. We give up on Him. We walk away from Him. If you think that God don't want nothing to do with you, is it's usually if you if you if you stop and think about it and turn around. He's standing right there for you no matter where you go. So, you know, I I don't, God is our, God is so forgiven, you know, because for what I've done, and I, I didn't even get detail to tell you things that I've done, because they would probably kick me out of New Jersey if they actually found out. <laughs> but the point is, and I say that, and I'm dead serious, but God has forgave me for all of them things, so if he can forgive me, and and then not even, not, not just forgive me, but use him, Use me as, as, as a soldier for him. Use me to go out there and tell people about him. You know, because my story is true. You know, my story, everything I say is true. I don't have to lie no more. You know, and for God to forgive me, number one, for all that, and then number two, to, to, to put, and see, in a way, he kind of hired me because he, he, my payment is, is that emptiness that I lived with all my life. He promised, me and him made a solemn promise together. 
you know, and it, meaning that if I, if I do anything he wants me to do, I follow him, I trust in him 100%. There's some things I do that I don't want to do. You know, the last thing I want to do is I'm a drug addict. I mean, I don't want drugs put in my face. And for me to go into a, and I'm not bragging on this, for me to go into a crack house to grab a kid, a young person, and bring him out and try to get him help, and then two days later he runs right back to the same crack house, or her, or a young lady that is, is shooting 60 or 70 bags of heroin a day, and go to, t and, and, and some, some guy is, is pimping her out, is prostituting her, young girl, 19, 20 years old, and to go and get her away from guys like that, and they turn around and go right back to it again. That's not what I want to do. I don't want to be a part of that because that was my whole lifestyle. But see, God knows that, you know, that as long as I focus on Him and I, I let Him lead me, I don't go do it on my own. Is I know the lifestyle, I know the people, I know what to look for, you know, and I won't stop it. This is where God has put me at, you know. I ask Him sometimes if I can get a secretarial job for a couple of months. <laughs> He's not giving it to you. So the point is, guys, is, is God's got a place for you and He's got a plan for you. Before you, before you were even born, God knew that I would be sitting here today talking to you guys. You know, he already knows what's going to happen when you guys are in my age. The point is, is, is why not stay with something that's a for sure deal? You know, and uh, the fun, I thought, oh man, I became a Christian, I'm going, there, there goes everything. Can't ride my motorcycle no more, I can't do this. I'm doing the same stuff that I was doing when I was out there in the world. Except I'm not drinking and drugging. And what happens is when you start doing the right thing, all those things you think is fun that you'll miss so much really don't matter no more. All that matters to me is, is, is God, plain and simple. He comes first in my life. He comes before my family. He comes before my friends, before my kids. And, and because of me doing that, he brought all of that stuff back to me. See, it's almost like a magnet, a giant magnet is what, to me is what it is. And when you stay God, when you stay focused on God and forget about everything else, is everything that matters comes back to you plus more. You know, I got more in my life now than I ever, ever thought I would have, you know. And it ain't got nothing to do with money or, or, or popularity or, you know, or big fancy cars or nice motorcycles. It ain't got nothing to do with material things. But because of growing up, my inside being so empty because I had, I didn't know what love really was. And God not only brought that love and, and filled me with that, you know, I can give all this back to somebody, you know, and, um, and that's what we do. Yeah? Uh, do you still go to the biker church? Hmm? Do you still go to the biker church? Yes, I do. Actually, I'm right in the middle of, like, a transition. I'm moving from one church to another just because of, you know, growth, I guess you could say. But, yeah, I still, and it ain't so much a biker church. It's just it's a church that loves Jesus, and um, that, that's what they're about. It's just the guys that go to it ride motorcycles, too. Absolutely. Yep. What made you not like break down and just like give up when it was like all really bad? We'll say that again? When it was like when you were just like all the way like down and rock bottom, what made you not like want to like, give up? I did what give up. I did give up. Because when 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 I came back, I was going I had some money in my pocket and I was going right back out. I mean, I still wanted to die. I I gave, I'd given up. I'd already given up completely. What happened was, back then I didn't know it, but God was inside me, and he was like kind of pushing me in a way. And what happens is I couldn't do it on my own, and this is what's so cool about God, is God to put somebody else in, in, in your path that will help you along the way. Because I was done. I mean, believe me, when, when I came out, I went and got my truck, I knew what I was going to go out and do. So what happens is he threw these little bits and pieces into my path. And what it was this time was my godson, which I love dearly, I went to say hi to him. That's all I was doing. I was going, went to say hi to him, more or less goodbye to him. And I was going out and I was going to kill myself. I, I just, I'd already given up. But what happened is, I went there. They told me, they said, what they tell you? And I said, they told me to go to a meeting. I said, what kind? They said, what kind? I said, I have no clue. They called a girl up that goes to meetings. She, they didn't know what kind. She came over, took me to my first meeting. Poof. And the rest is history. That was God. I'd already given up because I knew... If I didn't go to that house tonight, I would be dead. I would have been dead that night. And all it was was God putting somebody in my path because he already knew that physically I'd given up. Mentally and spiritually I'd already given up. 
So he gave me a little kick in the backside, so to speak. So he put the right people in front of me, and they led me. You know what I'm saying? And that, that's how he works. So um, giving up, I'd already given up. Just, uh, really want to thank you. And, and... The heart is a bloom.